here's your host, Kevin Warren. Jim Trabers lived a lifetime of extreme highs and lows and is barely 60 years old. He was an All-American athlete in high school and college where he played on a College World Series baseball team at Oklahoma State and quarterback the football team before playing professional baseball with the Baltimore Orioles. Jim has also gone through a divorce and two serious health incidents that almost took his life. For almost 30 years, he's been the host of his own highly rated show on the Sports Animal Statewide Radio Network based in Oklahoma City and routinely lands on lists of the best radio sports talk broadcasters in the country. His wife of almost 30 years, Julie, was the godsend that helped him turn his life around and helped him establish a personal relationship with Christ. I started our conversation asking him about where he grew up. I was born in Columbus, Ohio, but I only lived there for like a year. And the only daggone thing that I remember about it is when I played baseball and went back in AAA and the Yankees were in Columbus, that people would come up to me and go, I remember when you were a baby. I had no idea who the heck they were. So that's all I know about Columbus. And then we moved to a place called Hagerstown, Maryland, and we lived there for about seven years. And um, interestingly enough, I ended up playing baseball in Hagerstown, too, a long time after. And then when I was about a little over seven years old, I moved to a place called Columbia, Maryland. And it was an amazing place because it was a planned city. So when I moved there, there was less than a thousand people that lived in Columbia. So this was in like 1968. And uh, it, now there is uh, over 150,000 people. And huh. they, they just started this city in this uh, area like in between Baltimore and Washington. And they, uh, it was amazing. It was an amazing place. It was like a melting pot. So we had all different kinds of races, everything. We had all different kinds of people. And, like, they had rules like, for instance, if you had a McDonald's, you couldn't put your, your, the arches up. If you had a jack-in-the-box, you couldn't put the jack-in-the-box head up. You weren't allowed to do any of that stuff. And anything that you did, like, to your house, like if you wanted to paint, your, if you wanted to paint your door orange, you had to go to the neighborhood and make sure that, you know, you okayed it. And there were all little neighborhoods. Each little neighborhood had, like, a swimming pool and, a uh, like, a rec center. And it was just an amazing place to grow up. It really was. And uh, so I lived there all the way from when I was seven years old till I went to uh, college out at Oklahoma State. And we had, boy, we just had a bunch of great people, man, great families. And it was really, really cool to grow up there. And then we went to church. I grew up Catholic, and we went to church at what they called the Interface, Interface Center. So at this center, they had, like, one of the big rooms were, th- were for the Catholics. One of them was for the Jewish people. One of them was for the uh, Methodists. One of them was for the Lutherans. And so we all went to church in the same building but we had our own little areas where we worshiped and uh, just incredibly unique. The whole place that I grew up was very unique. And I learned a whole bunch about, uh, you know, being with other races and other religions and everything. And I think it really, uh, it really formed me and many of the other people I went to uh, school with. And I'll tell you, boy, we have some people from there that are just unbelievably successful. It was just an amazing place to be in Columbia, Maryland. And uh, I loved growing up there, but now I go back there and I don't even recognize it. So, like I said, there's over 150,000, and I moved in, I think there was like 850 in 1968. <laughs> so, pretty pretty cool place to grow up. Now, how much uh, younger are you than your siblings? My brother's seven years older than me, and my sister's six years older than me. So I was like a Catholic mistake. That's what I was. <laughs> they always say surprise, but we all know it's a mistake. And... Um, so, yeah, so I was, I was much younger than both of them. By the time my mama had me when she was 40 years old, which is unheard of back then. Now, you know, there's a lot of people that do that. But, yeah, she was 40 and my dad was 41. So they were literally a generation ahead of all of my friends' parents. So everybody kind of knew them as, like, almost grandparents. And by the time I was young, you know, I'm older than in the high school, and they were, like, over 50. So they were tired, you know, and I got to do whatever I wanted to do. Now, I wasn't a psycho or anything in high school, but 
I could basically do whatever I want to do. I got great grades. I mean, I, you know, I did everything I was supposed to do. Uh, but they were, like I said, they were very tired. When I, like when I graduated from college, from high school, they were 57 years old, you know? Mm-hmm. So it was, uh, it was a great life, though. My mom and dad were wonderful. They really were. You were a great athlete. You were an All-American in high school, and you not only played baseball and basketball. Yeah, I played football, basketball, football, basketball, and baseball in high school. But when I was young, I played a lot of tennis. And uh, But it got in the way because, like, I would play a tennis tournament in the afternoon, and then my mom would have to take me. I'd go play a baseball game at night. <laughs> so it just got, you know, I knew that I had a chance to be pretty good tennis, in baseball. But I love playing tennis because all these kids from like down in Baltimore and all those places, they were like, you know, these really rich people, rich kids, and they had all these lessons and everything. And I was just this big old dude at like 14 years old that played serve and volley when I was 14, right? And, uh, and these, these kids didn't know what to do. Like they were about as tall as a net, and I was, uh, I was a lot bigger than they were. So I really liked it. And the one year I, I went all the way to the finals of the massive tournament back there and I, I got invited to the Nationals and I went to play in Little Rock. I went to play the Nationals in Little Rock in tennis. But I had to give tennis up and basically concentrate on baseball. But, yeah, I played a bunch. Any, just about any sport you can imagine, I played it. Where, where did that drive come from, Jim? Was that uh, Did your parents play a lot of sports when they were younger? Was it because you had a, an older brother who played sports? whole family i mean my mother was a great tennis player and a really good golfer and my dad was a big time wrestler my brother i mean he was i mean he was an unbelievable stud he had everybody in the country wanted him to play football he went to play we played at the university of michigan but when i was young he's seven years older than me so when i was like 11 or 12 years old i mean i had bo Schembechler, woody hayes um vince dooley bobby bowden i mean they were all in my house recruiting my brother he was a big old tight end and defensive end, and he was just a stud and then great basketball player. And then my sister was a great tennis player. So, I mean, I just – that's what we did, man. We went to school, and we had to be good in school, and we could play sports, and we did it. So, yeah, I had a lot of drive. When I was young, everybody would say, aren't you, aren't you Pete Traber's little brother? <laughs> and all I said to myself was, there's going to be a day when they say, hey, you're Jim Traber, instead of Pete Traber's little brother. And I'm proud to say that when I got into high school, I uh, I did get it my own name. I ended up getting my own name instead of Little Pete. I know that you were an All American in high school. Was it was it baseball or, or was it both baseball and football? Were you all city in basketball? Baseball, football. I was all state in football, basketball, and baseball. And one of the interesting things about football was is that there were only at that time. Now this is back in 1979, so a lot of people listening to this weren't even alive. But in 1979. I was only the second person ever to be all state first team in on both offense and defense and the other one was my brother. So in 1979 there were only two people in the history of the state that were all state on both sides of the ball and it was my brother and me. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> Basketball, I was a point guard. I ran the point. We had some dudes that could really play. I led the state in assists. I wasn't a great shooter but you know, I played a lot of basketball, and then obviously baseball. I, I mean, I was on varsity as a freshman, so that that ended up being the most, you know, the sport that I took up the most. So, were you drafted out of high school in baseball? No, it was interesting. I had scouts come to me in in high school, and they, you know, they they really kind of probe you. You know, when you're in high school, they want to know what you're thinking and everything. And I just told all of them, I said, "Look, I'm going to I'm going to play football." I love baseball, and I'm going to play that too, but I want to play football. So I never got drafted. Um, the Orioles called me on the second day of the draft and said, hey, is there any chance that you would uh, you know, come this year? And I was like, no, no, there's no chance. Because I really wanted to play both. And so I did not get drafted. And um, I got what I wanted. You know, I had 35 football scholarships offers. And so I ended up going all the way out to Oklahoma and playing at Oklahoma State. So what was the what was the dream for let's say eighth grade Jim Traber? Was it to be an NFL player? No. When I was five years old, I told my mom and dad I was going to play in the big leagues, and that was my drop. That was my number one thing to do. Um, and then you know when I got to college, I really didn't have I didn't have much of a chance to play in the NFL. I mean I was six foot, you know, two hundred fifteen pounds. 
I wasn't your typical quarterback. You know, in the year that I came out, Marino came out, Jim Kelly came out. I mean, you know, it was some serious quarterbacks. So I wanted to play college football. I wanted to see what it was like. You know, football wasn't very big back where we were from. So I wanted to play some college football. But I always knew if I was going to have a chance to play professionally, I knew it would be in baseball. Let me ask you this, because you come to Oklahoma to play uh, football and and baseball at Oklahoma State. This would have been, what, 1980? 79 is when I came. And okay. Then I, yeah, and then I played football in 80. So I, I got to ask about uh, your your first marriage. When did that happen? And was that someone from high school that that you were in love with at the time and, and got married? Or did you meet her after high school? I met her in Rochester, New York. Probably, you know, wasn't uh, – met her at a bar. She worked at a bar. That should have told me something at the time. I was obviously uh, kind of crazy back then. And uh, we ended up getting married. And uh, I think I was married for like five years. You know, I, I'm really good at blocking stuff out, so I don't remember everything, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but we got married for five years. We had two children and uh, ended up getting divorced. It just was, I mean, it just wasn't good. And then um, I ended up uh, coming down to Oklahoma, you know, eventually and meeting my wife now. So it was, uh, it wasn't a real good time for me at the time, but. You know, I got through it and always learned from things, you know, and uh, I definitely learned from that whole experience. You know, you and I have known each other for a long time. Obviously, we work together sort of now. I mean, we air your program on the animal up here in Tulsa and have for the whole 17 years I've been here. But you and I worked together at WWLS 20 years ago when you were doing uh, Diamondback right. Baseball. I would actually host your show for you, and I'd bring you on your own show. Okay. <laughs> it was a weird deal, but... And, and yeah, through and through, time. yeah, well, and through that time, um, th- you know, like the stuff I'm asking you about, for instance, your first wife. I know that because I've been listening to you <laughs> for a long time. People who listen to you on radio, and this is this is what I think makes you so good, is that you just you're an open book, man. And I know when you first came on the, right. on the air, you would talk negatively about about your ex on the air but i noticed right. there, there was a time jim when you just decided i'm not doing that anymore you know there's no reason to to go down that path and i, th- I thought well i wonder if that's julie's right. influence on you you know or if it's god working in your life you know kind of convicting you to you know what jim there are some things that you don't have to to say and so i wanted to ask you about that well yeah Sure. I mean, I think I think it has a lot to do with how my life changed with with God. You know, I was a crazy man. I mean, I'm telling you, through college, the minor leagues, um, even some in the big leagues. I mean, I did a bunch of stuff that I'm not proud of. And then I came down here to Oklahoma after I had played um, in Mexico, came back. I had done a little bit of radio, got divorced. And then I went to play in Mexico, and then I came back here, and I met Julie. And I was still kind of crazy. And um, I I started realizing that this woman was unbelievable. I mean, she's one of the greatest women at the time I'd ever met. So I started trying to change my life a little bit. And um, that's interesting enough why I got fired uh, from WWS in the, in the very beginning, because you know, they wanted me to do this big strip ball, strip bar deal. They wanted me to go judge a uh, strip bar, um, like uh, people that were going to come, these strippers were going to do, and they wanted me to judge it. And uh, Julie was running, you know, working for this company that was dealing with pastors and things, and they all kind of knew who I was on the radio. And uh, I told them I really couldn't do that. I was, I was trying to change my life, and I got fired because of it. And um, I realized that, you know, at that point when I didn't have a job and I was literally, I had the, I had the nicest yard you've ever seen. I was, all I did was take care of the yard and lay around a swimming pool. That's all I did every day. And I was trying to find another job and they basically blackballed me out of the, out of the market. And I thought, well, I don't know what I'm going to do. And Julie, you know, Julie had a good job, but so I finally just decided that this is what God wants for me. And 
if I get another chance to go back on the radio, then I'm going to do some things differently. And the one thing that I said was, I'm not going to be negative about anything that's happened in my life. I mean, I still, once in a while, take some shots, you know. Once in a while, I'll say a little something here and there. But I just felt like it wasn't the right thing to do. And Julie had a big influence. But then I became, you know, then I, then, then I gave my life to Christ. And since then, it's just been a wonderful whirlwind. And, you know, you bring up about talking about your life on the radio. I tell people all the time that ask me this, I, um, I don't think there's one specific way to do radio. But I do believe that if you're willing to let people into your life a little bit, then I think that they act like they know you. You know, mm-hmm. my wife, Julie, she went from being a, uh, a uh, receptionist all the way up to the president and part owner of a big company. And she would get calls. She's the president over about... 75, 80 people. And she'd get calls, and they would call her Jewel because, you know, that's <laughs> what I called her. And there'd be people that think that they know her. Mm-hmm. And they'd, they'd call up and go, hey, can I talk to Jewel? And, you know, here she is running this big company. <laughs> so, look, there's been some negative part of that, Kevin. I mean, my daughters, you know, I, I went on the air one time and told the, the sex of one of my grandbabies by mistake. And, oh, my gosh, dude, it was the worst thing you've ever seen. All, and my whole family, they couldn't stand me, crying, yelling, screaming. I was just crushed. By the way, I, I told the wrong sex. I said it was a boy and it was actually a girl, so that's, <laughs> I guess that's okay. But, um, but I have found, I have found when young people come to me and say, boy, have you done this for 29 years? I tell them two things. One, never say anything on the radio that you don't mean. And I've never done that in 29 years. You know, people will say to me, oh, you just do that to, you know, get clicks. So you get that to fire people up. I don't. I never say something on the radio that I do not believe. And the other thing is, in my opinion, let people into your life a little bit. Then they think that you're like friends with them. And I think that you want to go listen to your friend. What's going on in Traver's life today? You know, when I get on there and say, some yard bird was on the on the on the road and doing this and stuff like that. You know, I'll get messages on Instagram of, oh yeah, man, yeah, oh yeah, I, that happens with me and blah blah blah. So, I it has been, it's been tough at times. It hasn't been the easiest thing, but I think it's helped me immensely, Kevin. I really do. I, I think that the people out there believe that they know me, and that um, that we're friends. You know, like they're mm-hmm. part of my family. They know all about my daughters. They know that. Um, Unfortunately, I don't really have a good relationship with my sons anymore right now, which is really sad. I pray about that a lot. And um, they know all about Julie. They know all about, you know, when my dog passes away. They know everything. And I think that uh, I think that's been part of my success. And, again, some people don't like to do it that way. But it's interesting because some of the other guys on the show, you know, like Al and Mark and some other guys, I think that over the years, they started to let a little bit more in. And I think that that really helps. I really do. Those who are listening to this podcast and who have listened to your show uh, know that you even talk about your relationship with God on the air, too. You'll tell people that you'll pray for them. And I want to go back, Jim, if I can. You, you talked about you know giving your, your life to Christ. Do you remember that? Was there a moment specifically when it hits you uh and did it break you down at all when 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 that moment happened you know it had been it had been it had been weighing on my mind strong you know i grew up as a catholic and catholicism is much different than what my wife you know my wife julie's father is a bat was a former baptist preacher matter of fact the first time i went to dinner at their house i had long hair and a beard and an earring in my ear and after it was over, he said to Julie, be careful of him. I think he could be abusive. That's what he said to her. And, of course, then I adopted his, da- his granddaughters. And, you know, so you, you see what's happened over those years. Um, but it wasn't one specific thing where it hit me in the head. It was just, it was weighing on me hard. And, uh, you know, Julie was just saying, I'm going to go to church. You want to go? I'm like, yeah, I'll go. I'm going to go to church. You want to go? Yeah, I'll go. And then it was like, Julie, going to church? And I finally found a couple pastors 
that to me, I felt like they were talking to me. They were speaking to me, you know? They were talking about real-life problems that men have. And I thought, now, this is really cool. And then I told Julie, I said, Julie, I'm, I'm ready to give my life to Christ. And she was so happy. And I ended up, you know, doing it. And, and then I ended up getting baptized. And it was l- literally the greatest thing. I mean, it was. And, you know, what's interesting, you brought up about talking about on the radio. I've been doing this for 29 years. Probably the number one thing that I've gotten in the most trouble for has been talking about my faith. Um, because they're scared of it, you know. Mm-hmm. And I always tell people, I'm not a philosopher, and I'm not that daggone smart. My wife is a lot smarter than me, and she knows the Bible like the back of my hand, uh, back of her hand. But I always tell people, you know, when they come after you about your faith, just remember, man, they killed Jesus, right? They killed the guy. He was the greatest person to ever walk the face of the earth, and they crucified him. So when you get out there and you profess your faith, you know, don't don't let people mess with you. I mean, I, I continue to do it. I My battles, you know, I don't just go on there and give a sermon, but I'll go on there and bring it up. And if I find out that somebody's hurting or if some listen, the greatest thing that's ever happened on my show has been the last couple of years with Rob's Ranch, with people, and I'm sure you've heard them, yep. people calling in crying, crying on the radio. I mean, I'm getting ready to cry right now, calling in and saying, I, I can't stop. I don't know what to do. And I get them with Rob's Ranch. There's people walking around the state of Oklahoma that have gone to Rob's Ranch, gotten rid of their addictions, and I feel like I was a small part of it. And that's good, dude. I mean, you know, I'd much rather do something like that than tell somebody who I think is going to win the game tonight, you know? So there's a bigger purpose. And I think that if you have a platform like I have, you need to put it out there. I truly believe that. And I know a lot of people are scared of it, and I know a lot of people don't like it. But frankly, I really don't care anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. I've been doing it for 29 years. If if they want to get rid of me for professing my faith, then I'll go somewhere else and do something else. But I feel like that it's important to let people know, the youngsters, the people that aren't saved, that, hey, look at me. I've been through a lot of things in my life, played Major League Baseball, played football, did a lot of different things. Now i got this radio show that I've been doing for 29 years, and I'm out there right now telling everybody God is good. And if you can do that, I think it's a wonderful thing. All right, I, I, I've got to ask before we uh, wrap this up about Julie, because you mentioned her a few times, and, and I feel like our lives in some ways, Jim, uh, parallel a little bit because I went through cancer a couple of years ago. I went through a bad case right. of COVID last year where I almost died. And the backbone for me and the person that was my advocate and stood in the gap for me more than anyone was my wife, Suzanne. And I know that you had that with Julie yeah. because you've had some serious health issues over the last few years, including the most recent was that a brain tumor just a couple of years ago. I wouldn't want to be her. I'll let you know that. She's been through a lot, dude. I mean, I've almost died a couple times. Uh, I've had so many different surgeries. Um, she's had to do some horrible things, man. You know, when my colon exploded, I almost died, like I said back then. Uh, she had to be a nurse. And, I mean, she's just amazing. She's the most amazing woman that I've I've ever been around. I mean, she's up there. You know, I've even put her ahead of my mama, and my mama was unbelievable. Um, yeah, she she ran a company. I'll just tell you this. You Listen to this. When my colon exploded, it was horrific. And almost, I, I, almost, I almost got sepsis. My lung collapsed. It was terrible. And I had to wear a, uh, I had to have a, uh, 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 what's it called? A, uh, I can't even remember what it is, you know. But anyway, it was bad. And the very first night, I, you know, I had tubes in my, my nose and I couldn't do anything. And I put a dip of Copenhagen in. And, of course, I wasn't supposed to do that. You know, I mean, I couldn't even, I couldn't swallow, I couldn't do anything, but I put a dip in. And um, it tasted terrible. And I said to Julie, I said, this tastes terrible, Jewel. She said, maybe you should quit. And I said, okay, I'm on morphine and everything else, you know. I said, okay. So I ne- I've never done a dip since then. But that night, I woke up in the middle of the night, I had that tube up my nose. And um, I ripped it out of my nose. I ripped it right out of my nose. And I was, I was so wasted and everything. I looked around the room for my Copenhagen can. I couldn't see it. 
this nurse came in and started yelling and screaming at me about, what are you doing? You can't get that out of your nose, blah, 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 blah. So the next day when Julie came in, I'm crying. I'm crying tears. I said, Julie, you can't leave me in the middle of the night. You can't leave me here. A monster comes in in the middle of the night. I'm telling you, a monster comes in. And that woman, okay, she has three little girls. She is running a massive company, and every single night, I was in the hospital for 11 days, every night she spent the night in that hospital. Wow. Every night. And I, I'm telling you, it was unbelievable. She's, she's an amazing woman. I wouldn't be here without her. So I don't, I, I, what she has done with my life has been absolutely amazing. I know you've had some horrible things. And it does, you are, we are paralleled in that. But the women in our lives are godly and wonderful. And literally, I think she's, I don't, I think I'd be dead if it wasn't for her. I, I truly believe that. I think I'd be dead. So I, uh, I thank God every single day for her. And I just tell all you men out there, hey, treat your women wonderful because I promise you, you don't know how good they really are. And you'll find out in bad times. And, uh, and then they're amazing. So I, uh, I have a wonderful wife and, uh, she has been, she has made me so much better of a man, so much better of a talk show host, uh, so much better of a father, so much better of a husband. So, so much better of a big daddy for my grandbabies. Uh, it, it is amazing what this woman has done for me. She really is unbelievable. So Jim, tell, tell the listeners, uh, uh, about the podcast, uh, that you and Julie, uh, I guess started, has it been a year yet? Right. It, next week is a year. Yeah. Um, it's been, it's been great. You know, I tried to get her to do this for about a year and, uh, Chris Baker, who was our, um, program director thought it would be a great idea too, but she really didn't want to and everything. And I said, Joel, this is going to be amazing. Cause I'm telling you, she's a star. If anybody's ever listened to it, it's the Julie and Jim Traver podcast and you can get it wherever you get podcasts, also at the sportsanimal.com, too. But um, it's really good. It's about family, faith, marriage. We've had some great guests. We had all three of our daughters on there, which was uh, Julie was just scared to death of, <laughs> and that was a lot of fun. And we had, we had two, our two son-in-laws we had on. Uh, we've had a lot of great people. Uh, but pretty much every week we just talk about different things with marriage. I've had people come. We're not marriage counselors. Matter of fact, we make mistakes all the time. We, we purposely tell everybody we're not marriage counselors, but we do uh, talk a lot about, you know, marriage. And Julie likes to do a lot of research and listen to other people and what they're talking about. And she brings the best to the table. And we just have a, a great time doing it. So if anybody gets a chance, it's called the Julie and Jim Traver podcast. And um, we really have a lot of fun. And like I said, next week, next week, we're going to do like a best of of the first year. Uh, so it's uh, we put comes out every Monday at uh, right before my show starts at two o'clock. Well, listen, from one podcast to another, I wish you great success in that, and God bless you, Jim and and Julie. And listen, I I, I hope you obviously have continued success with your with your radio show as well. It's it's dynamite. Um, I listen every day. Part of it is because I have to. Uh, but most of it is because I, most of it's because I want to, Jim, you're, you're, you do a great job. I'm thankful for, uh, you always bringing, um, uh, God into an equation whenever it's appropriate. And, and so I'm one of a lot of people out there that are thankful that you do that. And thank you for being a part of this podcast as well. Appreciate you having me on. And I really appreciate, uh, the Tulsa animal. I mean, I, I just love that we're being able to I love Tulsa. I've, I've loved the city for a long, long time. And uh, I'm so happy that we're on there every day. And I, I just appreciate you, man. I really do. My thanks to Jim for being so candid with me. You can hear Jim each weekday on the radio where his show is streamed at sportsanimalradio.com. My best to Jim, his wife, Julie, their kids and grandkids. If you want to hear more stories like this one, just go to suitup611.com. Never